Hello, future Boilermakers, and welcome to our live Q&A broadcast on YouTube for the majors here in Purdue Polytechnic School of Aviation and Transportation Technology, including Aeronautical Engineering Technology, Aerospace Financial Analysis, Airline Management and Operations, Airport Management and Operations, Aviation Management, and Unmanned Aerial Systems. We discussed the professional flight major in an earlier broadcast, and it's available as a replay on YouTube. So tonight we will focus on all of our other aviation majors. Congratulations to our student viewers who have been admitted to Purdue. We are so glad you could join us tonight for our panel discussion to give you some insight and information about our aviation related majors. I'm Vicki Gilbert, the recruitment placement and internship coordinator here at the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. Three professors and three current students are here with me. They will be our panelists and I will ask them to introduce themselves in a minute. We have several topics and questions that we'll ask them, but we also want to know what you want to know. You can submit questions via the YouTube chat window by signing into your Google account and typing them in. Our technical director, John O'Malley, will be monitoring the chat and will try to pass along our, your questions. If you don't get your question answered tonight, please feel free to stand, send a follow-up email to techrecruit at purdue.edu, and we will respond later on. Before we get on with our discussion topics tonight, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what you teach. Good evening, Don. Let's start with you. Hi, my name is Don. I am a assistant professor of practice in the AEP program. I teach the aircraft electrical courses. So I teach a 200 level aircraft electricity course, a 300 level avionics course, and a 400 level advanced electronics. Hi, Mike. Good evening and uh, welcome. My name is uh, Mike Suko. I'm a professor of practice here in the program. I teach a few of the upper division courses, um, capstone and airline operations courses. Um, I also do a little bit in the flight side of the house as well. And I uh, do a little bit of work with engagement, working out with industry partners that can support the programs for internship opportunities. Hello, Joe. Good evening. I'm Joe Hupe, and I'm a professor here in the aviation, and I happen to reside in unmanned aerial systems. My specialty in unmanned aerial systems is geospatial data collection, processing, and analysis. And that's just kind of a fancy way of me saying that I'm the one who teaches people how to make money with the drones. Thanks, Joe. For our student panelists, would you please each introduce yourself and tell us your year and where you're from? Dutch, let's start with you. Hi, um, my name is Dutch Bird. I'm a first year student in unmanned aerial systems and I'm from Southern Ohio. Good evening, John. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Fisher. I'm a sophomore in aeronautical engineering technology from Atlanta, Georgia. And last but not least, hi, Jansen. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Jansen Walker. I am a junior in aviation management, and I'm from Central Florida. Thanks, Jansen. Okay, let's get started by talking about some of our courses in our aviation-related majors. So, Mike, how are most of the major specific courses in aviation and transportation technology designed? For example, are they lectures, lectures labs, and are there group projects? So it's, it's a combination of lecture and some laboratories, uh, depending on, on the major that you select. Some have more intensive laboratories than the other, but it's uh, all of the courses uh, have worked really hard to be the lecture, but not the stand up boring lectures, but to engage students in the process and the classroom type material. So within, within the structure of the university or in the program, um, spend a lot of your time in class, but then you also go out, you know, we have an airport here, we have a lab right outside the door, a lot of hangars, a lot of airplanes, a lot of things to uh, work with. So it's a really good mixture of both. Joe, would you like to talk a little bit about how Unmanned Aerial Systems is set up? Sure, I'd be happy to. Unmanned Aerial Systems is set up, uh, it, it's set up in a way to promote the, the end user in terms of what the students are getting. And so what we first and foremost deal with is the fact that 
we are in an aviation program and UAS is aviation. That doesn't happen to be my specialty, but there are other faculty in the UAS major who are highly specialized in aviation policy mm -hmm. and they bring that into UAS. On my end, I'm affiliated with several other uh, groups on campus. Uh, I'm a member of the Integrated Digital Forestry Initiative group. They have, uh, they, they have some great university support and backing, and we work very closely with forestry and using unmanned area systems as a remote sensing tool to solve a lot of the problems that foresters use. I also work closely with people in earth and atmospheric sciences as an end use, because at the end of the day, a drone is a tool to gather data for people to solve problems in certain niches. And so in that whole regard, what we promote with the student is from day one entering the program, they're not just learning to fly this platform to fly it as a hobby. They're learning it to use it as a tool to make money and to solve problems and to integrate this as a legitimate tool within our economy. Thank you. And Don, would you talk a little bit about aeronautical engineering technology set? Sure. The AEP program is set up to be a combination of lecture and labs. Um, almost all of the labs are hands on labs with the end goal to help you prepare for your airframe and power plant certification so you can become a certified mechanic upon graduation. Um, there are some classes that do have group projects. Two of my classes have those. Um, but the majority of the, the coursework is entirely hands-on. You're going to be actually either working with systems for that class or working on a real airplane. Thank you. So we have a question from Amy Cousins for Jansen. I noticed you were from Florida. Why did you choose Purdue University? We are down on our final choices, which include FIT and Purdue. Would you would love to know what your thoughts are? Um, well, for me personally, um, I'd always kind of wanted that big college experience. And I knew that Purdue, you know, obviously doing pretty good at basketball. Sometimes we're all right at football. Um, so that's kind of always what I wanted uh, growing up in a heavy SEC family. I had to have some kind of like college experience other than um, obviously the great education that I'm going to be getting. Um, so I liked that Purdue's um, aviation department was pretty small, um, but there was also so much to do on main campus. So that was kind of my main draw. Thank you. So for all three of my students, and we will start with Dutch, then John, then Jansen. What are some of the projects and labs that you have done as part of your coursework? Um, so in unmanned aerial systems, some of the projects include um, learning more about the Mavic 2 Pro, which is the first uh, drone that you will be introduced to um, in your first year. Uh, so we go through things from just like the radio frequencies to the battery technology to the sensors on the drone. And then also you will have to log flight hours in a simulator. So that is on the computer, um, you're logging hours and basic flight maneuvers and different maneuvers to kind of get you uh, used to flying in drone. So that's in your first semester. Um, that's before you actually touch the drone at all. They just want to get you comfortable with actually flying if you have never flown before. Um, and then this, this semester um, we're focusing more on actually flying. So we'll go out and actually be able to fly the drone and perform those basic flight maneuvers um, in real life rather than just on a simulator. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, what the labs and projects are like so far. John? So in AET, we kind of go all over the place and in, inside airplanes. So we'll go into lecture and then um, I've had a lab where we went out, get on it, get into the cockpit of our Gulfstream G4, start up the APU, um, learn about all the systems on that G4. Um, I have a lab where I split a PT6 engine last week um, and did a full inspection of a PT6 engine where you split it apart, inspect all the components, put it back together. Um, in Professor Barnes's lab, we have full avionics mock-ups. So we have everything from steam gauges to a G1000 mock-up to um, a Proline 4, which is what you would see on some of the larger transport category jets. And we'll go through full inspections of those systems 
how the system works. We'll pull it apart, um, kind of look at the inner workings of, of everything behind it and um, kind of use that to get a better understanding of what's going on. So yeah, it's a lot of learning something in lecture and then going out and seeing it in person, pulling it apart, getting to touch it, play with it, do the inspections that you would be doing on it um, in industry. And Jansen. Okay, so obviously, since I'm in management, my uh, experience isn't going to be nearly as hands on as John or Dutch's, um, but I did have this class, um, it was airport uh, management, where I actually, uh, the guy who actually runs Purdue University Airport, um, he was the professor for it, so we did get to do a lot of cool things on the airport, um, get to see how they um, deal with birds, get to see all of the um, um, firefighting equipment that we have and in that class we also had to do um, like an airport plan and I did mine on Tampa International <laughs> but I still had to figure out how much snow removal equipment I would need so I acted like Tampa would get the amount of snow that Milwaukee would get and I had to kind of figure out you know what surfaces are going to be priority and how many snow plows am I going to need how much salt am I going to need you know all that good stuff um, and then another thing that's kind of stood out as a big project um, was in airline management. Um, there was actually, I think it was, I think it was all in groups of three. Um, we actually ran an airline. Uh, we got to lease or buy the aircraft. You decided kind of what you wanted to do, what routes you wanted to take, um, you know, what configuration of seats. Did you want spirit sized or did you want, you know, um, how much leg room you wanted? So it's a really cool experience to be able to. Uh, get like both sides get into the airport side of things and into the um, airline side of things. In addition to that, Jansen, we have someone who's wondering, they're admitted into aviation management and what kind of laptop or um, computer equipment would be best for that major? Um, I haven't had to deal with anything too um, heavy on the computer side of things. Um, for the most part, all you're going to need is something that will um, do Excel and PowerPoint and Word pretty well. Um, and I know that uh, through the university, we actually have uh, Microsoft um, Office. So on any computer, you can download that and use it off of the internet if you want to. So I haven't had any problems. Um, I have a Mac, so that tells you anything. <laughs> Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the majors of our school. So Don, how is aeronautical engineering technology distinct from other engineering technology majors in the Polytechnic? Um, well, first it deals with aviation. Um, it's um, more of a hands-on type feature where um, students are gonna get very intimate with some aircraft. Uh, they're gonna get pretty touchy-feely with them. Um, the cool thing about AET is it doesn't limit the student to just being a mechanic um, by virtue of having that, having that degree. They can be um, safety engineers, they can be quality assurance engineers. There's a whole, whole variety of career paths they can take. Thank you. And what percentage of aeronautical engineering technology students actually take the airframe and or power plant exams? And what is the pass rate? And is it possible to take that exam after the sophomore year? Um, it we'll start with the last question first. Um, new students would be under the new plan of study. So their first two years of classes are gonna be all geared towards their airframe and power plant education. Um, it's not required to take that test or to become certified, um, but you're taking the classes, so why not? Um, the typically, I think there's about 60 or 70 percent of our students that are in AET that take that test, um, and I have not heard of any student failing that test. Excellent. Thank you. So, Mike, we have a few majors, especially for students wanting to get into careers in management in the aviation industry, including airline management and operations, airport management and operations, and aviation management, and even aerospace financial analysis. 
What is unique about the polytechnic approach to studying management? You're on mute, Mike. There we go. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have um, management by definition is a fairly broad field and that's that's one of the uh, unique things about it. So we've taken this broad field called management and we've, we've narrowed it down to, to something called aviation because there is a tremendous uh, need for folks that understand the language of aviation. And, you know, um, so within the aviation management space, we further defined it down to more specialties that have the airport operation side of the house. So you have the ability to manage the airport, which is a critical part of the ecosystem. And then you have the airline side of the house. And that that is the um, that tends to be either in the revenue management side. So there are the folks that do all the airlines do a lot of hiring in that space. Or you get into what is the operation side, which tends to be in the dispatch, crew scheduling, manpower planning uh, type thing. So there's a little bit of overlap on the aviation management and operations and the airport management operations because they have that word operations in there. And you're still very much focusing on the uh, condition of the airfield or um, the state of the airplane and the state of the schedule, if you will. The third one that we added has, uh, has been a response to industry, which has been the financial analysis degree, which has two kind of career destinations. We, we work with an organization called ISTAT, which is the International Society of Transport Aircraft Traders. And uh, they're the folks that do the $100 million deals on the phone without dropping a hat, um, buying airplanes, selling airplanes, doing uh, engine swaps and deals like that. And so that, that group, likes to have people in, and, and can do the financial analysis. So they want to understand, do you know the difference between a 747 and a 737? You know, one's got four engines, one's got two engines. So they want to figure, you know, as long as you can speak that language, then we can, we can teach you how to um, um, calculate the finance and, and schedule the loans. We have several uh, students that have been extremely successful in, in that space. So um, so the three derivatives, the airport, airline, and, and, and financial analysis. And then the fourth one that is, it is uh, being actively recruited now is in, is in consulting. A lot of folks will take any of these skill sets and go into the consulting space uh, to help out. Uh, Oliver Wyman is a group that's coming in uh, at the Career Fair Day in two weeks to do some, to do some uh, head hunting, which is a good thing for students. Um, so there, there's a tremendous bit of opportunity in all four of these domains, um, all within that space called aviation management. Thank you, Joe. Um, unmanned aerial systems is a major we have offered since 2015. Would you please give us a quick introduction to unmanned aerial systems and how soon and how often do students get to fly unmanned aircraft? Well, I'm gonna let uh, Dutch follow up with me on this one, but I, I, and I'll also give Dutch a little insight into the future, but the unmanned aerial systems major has um, really undergone some significant changes in, in terms of wor really working closely with industry groups and people out there in the end user community in terms of what it is that we should be teaching in this program and, and one unmanned aerial systems first was developed here and it was developed here before i came here in 2018 it was structured a little bit differently than the way that we deliver it now in that before there was there was a large focus on the building of the platforms and well, the, 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 the ability to build the platforms and understanding the components of the platforms is, is, is a really good thing. One of the, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest advantages out there is, is not so much knowing how to build these platforms, but knowing how to integrate sensors on the platforms and also knowing what you can do with the sensors. And so, where I'm going with this is that in that first year, as Dutch was attesting to, the students really focus first on the simulators. They really focus on understanding the, the aviation background in terms of airspaces, 
and, and being able to fly safely and effectively in areas that what someone who gets that commercial UAS license through some online vendor might not have that insight into. Because yes, someone who's 16 years old can get a 107 license, but someone who's 16 years old might not have that insight to be able to apply for that waiver, to fly above 400 feet, to fly beyond line of sight, to, to be able to know how to fly at, at night using a thermal sensor. And so what, what I'm saying with this is that by the time the student gets into the 200 level, they're really gonna start focusing on a lot more flight and they're gonna move beyond the Mavic 2 Pro and they're gonna start flying some larger and a little bit more glitzy platforms than what they were flying at that, that beginning level. Now, by the time they get to me in the 300 level, what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm telling them, I'm teaching them GIS, I'm teaching them geographic information systems, I'm teaching them remote sensing. And the beauty of this program is that a lot of what I'm teaching in GIS can relate to people in aviation management, because a lot of what is going on, someone can use that GIS to look at how to effectively manage an airport using UAS. For example, flying it and detecting cracks in a runway, flying it and detecting that tree that's at a higher level, so at that 300 level, the students now know how to fly, but they're not just going out there to fly. We're not, we're not out there to teach them how to fly in a drone race. What we're doing is we're teaching them how to go out and fly for a major company like Amazon. We're teaching them how to go to a place like Harvard. I had a former student who's now a PhD at, student at Harvard in ecological sciences, and he's in Africa, and they're, they're doing a lot of work with, with wildlife and one of the things that he was saying is how instrumental he is because not only does he know how to fly safely and effectively, he knows how to fly these LIDAR platforms, be able to gather that data and come home and know that they don't have to go to Africa and fly it again. So by the time they get to that 300 level, they're gonna be going out and they're gonna be flying thermal imagery. They're gonna be flying multi-spectral cameras. They're gonna be flying high resolution cameras. They're gonna be gathering information that's down to the precision of sub centimeter, which is really important because when you start flying for that engineering company, such as Airs, when you go out and fly for Michaels Construction, which is a multi hundred million dollar company with hundreds of millions of dollars of inventory across the country, flying everything from pipelines to utility lines, you're gonna know what sensor to deploy and how to deploy that sensor, and you're gonna make that company very happy. And then by the time they get into that 400 level capstone or to take that entrepreneurial class, that student in that capstone class is gonna be able to work in the capacity of doing some, what I'm really excited about this semester is that we're doing some really fun research where we're going out and we're looking at all different ways of establishing what's called control in UAS by using everything from survey GPS putting out these markers to using on the fly correction technology to post correction technology to kind of figure out what is best. Those students then not only are flying that, they have all that information, they are also creating an e-portfolio. To me, an e-portfolio is essential because when you walk out of this university, all those assignments that you submitted on that LMS, Brightspace or whatever platform, is, is void because no one gets to see it. But all that cool stuff that these students do, they make that e-portfolio and they put it out there in terms of what they're flying, but what they did when they flew. So I know my sound bites up, so I'm just gonna mute it again. Dutch, do you have anything to add? Um, I think he covered most of it. Some of it I didn't even know, which makes me excited for these upcoming classes. Um, but just in my first two um, semesters, or yeah, first two semesters, um, really it's just about, like uh, Dr. Hupe said, um, getting comfortable with the drone, um, getting comfortable with knowing the parts, the systems, and just the technology of it before advancing into those higher level classes and um, building on the drones that you're building. So first it's a smaller, um, more personal drone, and then we get into more um, industry size, higher up. So he covered it mostly, but I think that, yeah, that about does it. Thank you.
And Joe, Matthew K has a question regarding the computer side of unmanned aerial systems. Will there be any writing of code for those drones or is it all provided? On my end, I do have a little bit of model building, but what's really exciting for us in the program is we have a new hire, Nathan Rose. And Nathan Rose is introducing students into some code and he's using, I'm going to put a plug in for my wife, Christina Hupe here, who is with GitLab. He's using GitLab technology, which is a DevOps platform. So it's both development of software and operations. And that is, uh, these are some of my former students and they've come up to me and they said that they're really excited in, in terms of how they're using the code because it's a, it, they're using code, not just in a theoretical fashion, but they're using this code to apply it in terms of how to integrate these different sensors. And what really excites me in terms of what Nathan Rose is up to is that he's moving beyond the proprietary platform of DJI. We like DJI for teaching, but we understand that there are there's constraints and limitations in, in that. And so what Nathan Rose is doing is he's teaching some open source, but he's also introducing some coding. I can't attest to fully in, in terms of how much he's doing it, but from the feedback that I've gotten, what he's introduced to the students has brought nothing but excitement and understanding how that coding can lead to bigger and better things. Thank you. Mike, do our aviation managers have a senior capstone project requirement and is it incorporated in the plan of studies? The short answer is yes and yes. <laughs> we do have a capstone requirement um, and that, that varies um, based on the professor that's teaching the capstone course. One of the, in, in one of the capstone courses that I teach, I have them develop a podcast. And then I take that podcast and send it out for industry critique so that they get some feedback from folks from industry. So we try to be creative with the different uh, vehicles that we have for those capstone events. To, but they're, that, they're capstone by definition. So you work as a team and you develop a, a theme, you develop the project and you, know, you develop the product to deliver both the end. And different, uh, different uh, professors have different ways of, of administering that process. Thank you. So continuing with Mike, is there a professional work or internship experience requirement and how do most aviation technology students accomplish this? So yes, within the School of Aviation and within the Polytechnic, there is a, a, a requirement for an internship and um, they can be met various ways. But one of the things that I do within my engagement is to um, meet with companies and uh, help them understand and connect uh, with us so that they uh, advertise the internship opportunities. Um, American Airlines has some for AM students for aviation management. We'll just use AM to talk about all four of the, the subs there um, to go down to uh, Dallas and, and work in, in the revenue management side for an internship. We've got some with Southwest. We have some with United. We have so we have a lot of internships. We have some with, as I mentioned earlier, Oliver Wyman in the consulting as an analyst. Um, I'm talking to a helicopter company that wants to do one for AET. So there, you know, internships. And as we are coming out of COVID, uh, we are getting more and more requests and uh, and for that and opportunities for students to take advantage of that. The the the. Uh, COVID times have definitely put a damper on the experience for a couple of years and they were a lot of virtual type internships, but we are now getting a lot of interest and activity to get the physical internships back, back in place. Thank you. So I'm going to go to Don and then Joe to talk a little bit about the company connections and industry partners that Aeronautical Engineering Technology and the Unmanned Aerial Systems have to help support students. In uh, AET, we have our industry partners are VE uh, and Rolls Royce, Holland Aerospace, and Pratt and Whitney. Uh, pretty much anybody that supports aviation type program, we have partnered with in some way or another, either through internships or having them donate 
lab equipment to us that we can use or having them come in and talk to classes about what the students need to be looking for or what they should be doing professional development. And Joe? Yeah, so one of the things that I really pride myself on, and this goes back to when I was in Wisconsin before coming here, is the close connections that I maintain with alumni. And a lot of the company connections that we have are through my connections with, with, our, with, with the former students. And so even to this day, being at Purdue, I, the connections that I have with former students lead lots of opportunities to the graduates that we have here getting jobs with the companies that those students are placed in. For example, just today, there's a, a, a ground control point technology called propeller arrow point. And those are these uh, markers that are placed. They were developed in Australia for the mining world. And I had a student who is now a supervisor there contact me and say that they needed some people who were tech savvy with UAS and with uh, ground control points to join their support team. And he more or less said, you know, I'll go on your word in, in terms of who you can recommend. And I put that out to some students and they are now reaching out to this company. Um, I also have some pretty good relationships with some UAS providers. Uh, this could be anywhere from someone who develops uh, a technology for gathering information at a high precision in North Dakota to having a really close relationship with a company called C Astro. Right now, the program is working on establishing an internship program with C Astro to where we can get our students who are going to work on servicing the platforms and also on, on basically providing training. And this is a benefit to C Astro because they're based in Slovenia and they are looking to get into that US market. So we're really excited about that. Um, just across the board in terms of putting students into companies that work for some of these major construction companies like Michaels, all those relationships are maintained. And that's one of the things I take pride in in terms of maintaining those relationships, but also after those students leave and they enter that workforce, other than an industry advisory board, for me to reach those students and say, what, you know, what, what did you, what are you seeing there that you think you could have gotten in this curriculum? And me adjusting on the fly because UAS is not an established science such as geology and forestry. UAS is, is developing at a logarithmic pace. And it's very important that we maintain connections with industry, including our most recent graduates to not only place them into jobs, but to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of where things need to be. Thank you. And keeping with the company connections and internships, I'm going to turn it over to the students. So Jansen, then John, then Dutch. Could you tell us about your experience with an internship or other real world experiences? Where did you go? How, was you, how did you do your studies at Purdue? And how did that translate into working experience? So Jansen? Okay, so um, right now it's actually crunch time to get in applications for um, internships for the summer. Uh, so I can probably speak for all of us as I'm doing that right now. Um, but last summer, I actually had the opportunity to intern at my home airport. Um, so I was basically uh, shadowing um, the executive director of that airport, um, which is also uh, it's kind of a couple of modes. Um, they have a railway that goes through there, a major highway that goes through there. So it's a big um, kind of port for uh, all kinds of uh, cargo and uh, things to come through. Uh, I was able to kind of see the FBO side of things, see how that runs. There's also a flight school that I did my flight training at. Uh, so there's lots of things that I got to experience through that summer. Um, and there's, let me tell you, there's a ton of internships that um, are available. So. John? Yeah, so um, kind of similar to Jansen, I think the Purdue name in general just really carries its weight. Um, right after my freshman year, I applied to a whole bunch of maintenance facilities back home at my home airport, um, just flight schools and um, basically line mechanics back home, and it ended up starting a bidding war. So um, I got 
a really good, really good pay over the summer to work um, aircraft maintenance on standard general aviation airplanes, which kind of transferred back into um, what my coursework is right now and what that AMP exam is going to be. Um, so that was really nice. Um, I also got to be a test pilot because they figured out that I was a pilot. And, you know, anytime the plane had some issues, I would get to go fly it and then get to go learn how to fix it. Um, in addition to that, um, just kind of going on with how Purdue carries its weight in gold. Um, I'm currently working with a small cargo company called FedEx. Um, so hopefully in the next two weeks, there is a um, partnership going up for approval in front of corporate. Um, so if that comes through, we'll have kind of a partnership to hopefully pipeline some mechanics, uh, AET students, and also some pilots into, um, into FedEx. So. And Dutch. Uh, yeah, so this, this coming up summer, um, I don't have any plans for an internship. I'm planning on doing it more my uh, sophomore and junior um, summers. Um, but this summer, I'm actually, I have like a um, aerial photography and videography business back home. And I kind of did that in high school, but coming here, I, I didn't know as much or anywhere near as much as I did um, here. So I'm able to actually apply what I've learned in these last two semesters to make my flights safer um, and kind of more um, something that uh, companies or people back home would be more fond of uh, hiring me for because like I said, there, I didn't know a whole lot. Now I know more about the rules, regulations, um, better ways to conduct safety flight, safer flights. So as of this um, summer, I don't have any internships lined up, um, but in the coming summers, I definitely plan on interning for multiple companies. Thank you. So Jansen, I'm going to turn this over to you as you are an aviation management student, but you also are a pilot. So can you talk about how you are making that work with your coursework? Okay, so um, originally uh, the summer before my senior year, I started flying um, and through that course of that year, I was able to get my private license. So when I came into Purdue, um, I had my license and I honestly have not really flown that much since, sadly. Um, I did last semester try to uh, start ba like back on my instrument uh, here at Purdue Aviation, which is not affiliated with the university, um, but it is on the like airport. So if that is something that you are interested in, I know that John also flew there. Um, so he's done a lot more than I have. Um, but uh, you can definitely uh, do it. I know plenty of people who just kind of work it into their schedule like it were a class or a lab um, here at the university. Um, obviously, it's not exactly the same as being in professional flight because, you know, you're not going to get a, be getting that restricted ATP with the 500 hours shaved off. Um, but it is if you're still looking or you still want that door open to possibly be a pilot in the future, um, it's a good way to do that. You can definitely juggle it all if you really try. John, would you talk about your experience? Sure. Um, so I came into Purdue with my instrument rating, private and instrument. Um, and since I've been here for the last two years, I've worked through my commercial license, my commercial multi-license and my CFI certificate. Um, so juggling all of that with uh, the coursework of AET and um, I was also double majoring a little bit there for a bit. Now it's dropped to a minor in general management. Um, it's doable. It's definitely difficult and you know, you have to put school first, but professors in the program in the school of aviation in general are usually pretty understanding. And then also everybody um, instructors at Purdue aviation are usually students or have been to Purdue or are familiar with how Purdue works. Um, so they are all pretty understanding of schedules and pretty flexible. So it's, it's possible. Um, and it's not anywhere near like super hard or impossible to get all of your licenses and, and work outside of class and all that stuff. There are plenty of students that do it. Um, but you do get some things like my CFI check ride started at 8 AM, went to class at 1030, went back to, or went back to the check ride at 1120, went back to class at 12, went back to the class, uh, check ride at one o'clock and finished at about three. 
so that was that was a wild day but you know i got it done the dp was understanding worked around my schedule i worked around his schedule so yeah it's it's doable it's a lot of fun though thank you so mike that leads me to students who are in aviation management or one of our other majors who are wanting to fly or who are wanting to transfer into professional flight how are the options for those students who want to stay in another major and still fly or want to transfer so two parts to that question the first one is that as has already been alluded to by our students here that you can stay in the primary major that you're in aviation management aet and you can go over to purdue aviation and sign up and, and learn how to fly. So they have fully approved and vetted either part 61 or 141 type training uh, programs. Um, most of the instructors are Purdue students or Purdue or recent Purdue grads. Um, so yeah, we work hand in hand. They are a sister organization, although they are separate from the university proper. For the CODOS um, change of degree options, you, we, uh, we, the, the flight program, professional flight program, uh, uh, accepts applications for that, uh, spring and fall, I believe twice a year, we, we look at the application. So you, you make a formal request for a change of degree option. And then that the requirements for that, there's some paperwork requirements and from forms that need to be filled out and then they are evaluated and then based on the number of slots that we have available, then we will offer folks the opportunity to change of degree into the professional flight program. And if you are successful in that, you are, the, the re restriction on that is that you will have agreed to come in and do all your flying in the summer. So that's the one change point on that is that <clears throat> you do all your theory and coursework spring and fall, because we are, pretty well maxed out as far as capacity with 100, 110 students coming in as a cohort for the flight. So that takes up a lot of the capacity of our fleet of airplanes. We've got about 20 airplanes that we use and simulators. So in the summertime, we don't have quite the, the demand on the, the uh, fleet. So that's when we uh, uh, have said structured it so that you would do your flying in the summer. So you would agree to that. And we also guarantee we have the priority and you get priority in scheduling to take care of the uh, simula aircraft and simulators that you would need at the time. You can also, but once you're in the professional flight, you can also minor in management or one of the other degrees as well. So that, that's really the, the, just the more challenging portion of the CODO is the fact that you, would, you are agreeing to fly in the summer to complete the time for the ratings. Can you clarify what Purdue Aviation is and mm -hmm. how it's distinct from the school? I was wondering if someone's going to ask that question. So Purdue Aviation started as a company called Lafayette Aviation. And Lafayette Aviation was purchased by a partnership agreement between Purdue Research Foundation and uh, a very one of our, our major benefactor, very generous uh, Dr. Scott Neiswanger, whose name is on a couple of our buildings out there. So Purdue Aviation is a for-profit entity. Purdue University is a nonprofit university and school. So they are two very separate entities. Even though Purdue Research Foundation owns 50% of Purdue Aviation, it is under the Research Foundation's uh administration not the universities so there are separate employment separate contracts separate um everything that makes it a business but the primary difference is it's for profit and the university is a nonprofit. so the way they are corporately structured makes them different thank you mm -hmm. so john then jansen then dutch what have been your favorite aspects of studying in your major john um, definitely the labs. Um, AET has a lot of amazing labs with a lot of amazing equipment where you get to go in and uh, take apart things and see things that most students at, you know, 20 or whatever wouldn't be able to see. Um, so for me, uh, I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, but being able to get into a Gulfstream G4 
and press buttons and start the APU up um, and see how that system works. And then going back into class and talking about that system, it really just kind of helps broaden that understanding. Um, and then additionally, um, kind of like I talked about before as well, having access to um, high-end avionics that you would see in industry and being able to get that hands-on experience and hands-on training prior to getting into industry. So you kind of, you have a massive leg up if you do decide to go into industry for uh, maintenance or a safety engineer or quality engineer, anything like that. Jansen? So like I had said earlier with the projects and things that I've done, um, I think that those really helped kind of have helped me have a better understanding of how things actually work in the industry and get some, you know, hands on experience as much as I really can. Obviously, I'm not going to be making my own airline and everything, um, but it was a super cool experience to kind of figure out, OK, if I do this with the prices, how many tickets are going to get bought and which um, routes are going to be most profitable. I really enjoyed that. Um, I also really enjoy um, getting to know all of like the policies and things like aviation law and also like the revenue uh, management side of things. Um, I've had a couple of like economics classes that, and how that relates to aviation and the decisions that Delta versus United have been making um, and you know mergers like Frontier and Spirit that's going to be coming up. Uh, things like that. It's super cool to see like how numbers like play into that. So. And Dutch. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with John. I, I really um, enjoy the labs. The lectures um, are really awesome too, um, but it's really about applying the knowledge that you learn in lectures to the labs. And I like, I'm more of a hands-on type person. So obviously I like the labs and um, I'm super excited for actually being able to fly the um, drones this semester. Last semester, the simulators were um, a lot of fun, but it just made me want to even to fly the drones actually um, even more. So with the major, I definitely would say the labs for hands-on experience and just being able to physically interact with the drone and all that. Thank you. And staying with the students, Dutch, then Jansen and John, what organizations are you involved in that are related to the major and then outside of aviation? Dutch? So relating to the major, um, Aviation Ambassadors is one of the organization, organizations I'm a part of. Um, so what we kind of do is, well, this is an example, getting to talk to um, future students. And what we do here is more take students on tours, um, be, being able to show them the facilities and answering questions. Um, another organization I'm part of is we are currently in the process of making or getting a drone club up and running. There was a drone club that was started. Um, I think it has kind of faded since then. Um, so we are trying to revamp that and trying to make it bigger again. Um, and then also dealing with outside of my major, my um, main thing is run club. I'm a huge um, runner. I was a runner in high school and I enjoyed it so much. I'm not fast enough to be on the D1 team, um, but so the run club is an amazing option. Um, there's guys on there that are way faster than guys on the D1 team, which is pretty crazy. And something nice about run club is it's just a group of everyone that just loves running and just wants to just have fun with each other. And um, something I like about it is it's not as time demanding as maybe the D1 team would be. So yeah, those are my organizations. Jansen? Okay, so obviously I am also an aviation ambassador. Um, with that, like you said, we give prospective students a uh, look into our lives and our facilities. Um, also, I had the opportunity to represent the university at Oshkosh last year. So if anyone knows what that is, it's a huge plane uh, festival, basically. Um, so that was really, really cool. Um, beyond that, I'm also an aviation technology uh, student council member. Uh, basically, we try to foster a good relationship between faculty members and students as well as we are the ones who host the um, career fairs. We're ha we had one in the fall and we're having one uh, two weeks from now. Uh, so that's something that we really like to push. Um, 
I'm also on the executive board for Purdue Aviation Day, which is going to be um, an uh, event that we have out at the airport. We're expecting like 10,000 people to be there. So I'm gonna be herding cats all day uh, with my volunteers. I'm in charge of uh, when and where all my volunteers are supposed to be. Uh, I'm also in women in aviation. Uh, our biggest thing really that we do uh, is Girls in Aviation Day. And we just kind of try to um, let girls know that they, they do have a place in this industry um, and get some exposure to it out here at the airport. Um, beyond that, I am also um, in Greek life. So I'm in a sorority. Um, I was the vice president of philanthropy and I got to do some really cool stuff through that, raise money for um, our national philanthropy. Um, and beyond that, I was also on, uh, kind of strange, but I was also on the livestock judging team for Purdue um, last year. This year, it didn't really fit in my schedule, um, but you can really be involved in whatever you wanna be involved in on campus, so. And John. All right, so there's no way I can top that, but um, <laughs> I'm a member of Aviation Ambassadors, and just one thing to add to what Jansen and Dutch said, um, in addition to giving tours and talking to new students and prospective students, we also have opportunities to go meet with um, industry professionals, go tour facilities. Um, I know we just went and toured Republic, um, so that's another great opportunity being part of Aviation Ambassadors. In addition to Aviation Ambassadors, I'm part of Alpha Eta Rho, which is our aviation professional fraternity on campus. Um, again, that's just a group of people that get together and you know talk about aviation, um, go tour uh, facilities, working on touring FedEx and United right now, um, and then just kind of sharing our love of aviation. Outside of aviation, um, I'm a member of the sailing club, which is interesting because I'm from like very far from any coast um, and don't know how to sail, but it was. <laughs> It sounded cool, so I joined it. Um, I'm also a Boiler Gold Rush team supervisor. So I was a team leader last year, leading new students around for our week-long orientation program. Um, this year, I am a supervisor, so I have a group of about 10 team leaders. Um, and I basically teach them how to lead new students around campus and teach them how to give them the best orientation experience they can have. Thank you. Were any of my students a part of the learning community for aviation and did you find it beneficial and would you recommend it? If so. I actually am a part of the uh, learning community um, and I, yes, I really enjoy it. Um, just getting to be with all these guys up here. I'm about the only unmanned aerial systems um, student up here, but I'm learning a ton more than I would have. Um, about airplanes that's basically what the only talk is about out up here other than like purdue football and basketball but um getting to live up here with these guys have events with the guys um, i know just like going down and playing ping pong or just things like that and just getting to meet them meet here where they're from and just to get to talk about our love of aviation um is super awesome and then the first semester if you're in the aviation learning community you will have a class with them and it's just super awesome um, because you just get to know them even more. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend if you're even considering it of any, to any degree um, to at least apply for the aviation learning community because I have found it very beneficial and I love it so much. Thank you. So Don, what careers do graduates of aeronautical engineering technology usually pursue? Uh, it's, it's very. Um, we've had graduates that have just gone on to be airframe and power plant mechanics. Um, we have graduates that work for Honda Automotive, not aviation, doing engineer work for them. Um, a lot of our students tend to stick with aviation companies, but it's not limited to that. Um, <clears throat> have a graduate uh, from a couple semesters ago that worked for a company called Ursa Major. They do propulsion. Um, a lot of them, though, like you said, stick with aviation. Thank you. Mike, similar question for you. What career opportunities do graduates in our various aviation management majors pursue? 
Well, the, the, the dominant for hiring at scale is generally the airlines. So we generally, you know, American Delta, Southwest, United, Frontier, you name it. Usually the entry path is through revenue management. Uh, some, there are starting to be more openings in the uh, SOC, uh, Systems Operations Control, uh, crew scheduling and resource manpower planning, and then work your way up to potentially dispatch, the license for dispatch ratings 23. Um, so there's folks doing that. Um, next one behind that are airports. Airports tend to hire people, smaller GA type airports will we'll, we'll pick up folks from the uh, airport management side. The financial analysts tend to go to uh, leasing companies. We have several folks that are doing, um, as I mentioned earlier, from some fairly significant deals. Uh, airlines pick up some of the folks for that as well uh, on the uh, fleet planning side of the house. And then uh, consulting firms, consulting firms, Oliver Wyman, um, Brown and company, there's a few that will come in and, and uh, be a, uh, consistent attendees at the career fair, specifically looking for uh, the AM graduates. So it, it, it covers the gamut. We, we place some it, at the OEMs, uh, Airbus and Boeing, and, and some of those areas uh, that are more in the staff finance accounting side than they are in the actual engineering side of the house. So very broad, as, as broad as management is from a degree structure is, is the opportunities for folks um, within the industry. Thank you. Joe, same question for you as well. What careers are out there for graduates from unmanned aerial systems? Yeah, it, it, it really depends on the, the avenue that they want to take in, in unmanned aerial systems because there's, there's the building end of it. The largest, the largest segment that I see students going to is that end user community. But then there's also an R and D component of it that some students go into. So I've had students go to a company called NTP Drones, which is uh, more or less a tethered drone company where they take a DJI platform and they take the the brain out of it, out of you, if you would, and they put it in an open source so it can fly critical infrastructure. Some students go into that end user construction community. I had a former student who is now with Amazon. Uh, another student is in the R&D segment of the UAS and they're with NASA. Um, it's, it's really, it, it, it really is, is that there's, there's the people who build the better mousetrap, but then there's the people who go into that end user. And that end user community is really diverse because when you look at UAS, it, it is a niche tool in terms of being able to fly lower and slower, gather data at a higher temporal, which means you can go out and gather it three times a day if you want, and it also has that higher spatial resolution. So if a company is looking to use a tool, whether or not it's a thermal sensor, a multispectral sensor, an atmospheric sensor, in the case of NASA, then they're gonna use that technology. So I guess that, you know, kind of alluding to what Mike was getting at is it, it, there's there's a couple of different paths, but what I see the majority of these students going into are fields that are relating to the end user wanting to use these as a tool to gather data for what they want to make things cheaper and faster. Thank you. So, Don, what kind of research projects and opportunities for AET students do we have at Purdue? Uh, I think it kind of depends on on what you want to do. Um, for me, I have my students. We um, are starting to get into a research project on all electric aircraft and how can we have an all electric aircraft that is capable of flying from the US, say, JFK to Heathrow. Um, what do we need to overcome to make that happen? Um, other professors, they, they have their own research that they're doing. Um, I know with COVID, it kind of brought a standstill to some research. There was still some going on, but um, it's starting to pick back up. So it just kind of depends on what the student's interest is. 
what they want to do. Thank you. So last question for our students. What advice do you have for future aviation technology students to be successful? Jansen? Uh, definitely, wherever you end up going, get involved. That's how you're going to make um, friendships and um, connections that you can use throughout your in or throughout your careers. Um, it's fun and it you know it gives you like experience public speaking you know learning about different um, sides of the industry. So definitely just get involved. Dutch. Yeah, I think with um, getting involved is a big one, and I think um, something that I've done is also just make sure I like to sit close to the front of the classroom. Also, um, just kind of take a moment and like introduce yourself um, to professors or just faculty member because I think putting yourself out there and letting them put a face to a name um, can be definitely beneficial in the end. So even if that may be uncomfortable for you, I would definitely suggest um, just putting your name out there and introducing yourself to your professors. Cause it, can be, it can benefit you in the long run. And last but not least, John. Uh, yeah, so ditto to basically everything so far. Um, get involved. Get involved in something that's related to your major. Get involved in something that's, in something that's not related to your major. Um, and get involved in something random, like Sailing Club. Um, it just keeps your mind. You can do school, but then you also have um, opportunities for breaks outside of school, opportunities to meet people outside of your major, outside of your industry. Um, also, just get to know your professors. Um, the more your professors know you, the more they're willing to help. Um, I've had COVID twice and knowing my professors by name has really helped me kind of get back um, after quarantine. And then also just ask, like ask for anything. Um, like I kind of mentioned earlier, I'm working on starting a partnership with FedEx right now uh, between Purdue and FedEx. And that was based off of a random email that was sent to like the FedEx frequently asked questions email. And it just got sent up the chain because somebody said, Hey, this kid from Purdue thinks that this might be a good idea and it kind of sounds like it might be and it just kept getting sent up and then somebody who had some authority said, all right, let's get on this. Let's see if we can make something happen. Um, and then my last piece of advice is wherever you go, whatever major you happen to choose, um, do orientation, um, do the orientation program. If you come here, do BGR. Um, it's a great opportunity to meet people, get out of your comfort zone and kind of make that switch from living at home, being in high school to being on your own, being in college um, and kind of starting that new life. Thank you. That about wraps up our discussion tonight. Thank you again to our viewers for joining us and submitting questions. And we hope you gained some good insight about the majors in Purdue School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. Thank you again to our awesome panelists for joining us and sharing their insights and experiences as well. And thanks as well to John O'Malley, our technical director for all the behind the scenes work. As I mentioned before, please feel free to send us an email at techrecruit at purdue.edu if you have any additional questions for us about the school, the Polytechnic, or Purdue. If you haven't already joined us for one of our admitted student information sessions or student to student chats, we still have several of those coming up in the near future. We have a YouTube broadcast coming on April 13th, 2022, that will focus on student life at Purdue University for all students admitted to the Polytech majors. You can find information for all those engagement opportunities on the Polytechnic admitted student information page. As a reminder, we had a broadcast that focused exclusively on our professional flight major back on February 28, 2022. A replay of that broadcast and all of our other broadcasts are available online at polytechnic.purdue.edu slash live. Just as a quick reminder, your deadline to accept your offer of admission is May 1st. Thank you again all for enjoying it, for joining us and have a great rest of your night and boiler up. <laughs>